Federalist 40, Part 3. This is paragraph 11. No stress, it is presumed, will in this case be laid on the title. A change of that could never be deemed an exercise of ungranted power. Alterations in the body of the instrument are expressly authorized. New provisions therein are also expressly authorized. Here then is a power to change the title, to insert new articles, to alter old ones. Must it of necessity be admitted that this power is infringed? so long as a part of the old article remains those who maintain the affirmative out the those who maintain those who maintain the affirmative ought at least to mark the boundary between authorized and usurped innovations between that degree of change which lies within the compass of alterations and further provisions and that which amounts to a transmutation of the government. Transmutation means total change of the government, total change of the shape of the government. Will it be said that the alterations ought not to have touched the substances of the Confederation? The states would never have appointed a convention with so much solemnity, nor described its objects with so much latitude if some substantial reform had not been in contemplation. So all those states would not have okayed these delegates to go to the convention in Philadelphia if they were not expecting a change, a big change in this old constitution. Again, we are, Madison is answering uh, the anti-federalists that have been criticizing and who told you you could go to the Philadelphia Convention and bring us a totally new constitution instead of revising the old one. And Madison, in the first two parts of this federalist that we looked at, said you always have to look at what's best for the whole country, what's best for all of the 13 states. If we had stuck with the old system, the fact that under the old Articles of Confederation, you had to have every state unanimously vote for amendments, that would put us behind. That would not make us into a strong union. We would be weak. So we got together in Annapolis, the Annapolis sent a resolution to the Congress. The Congress decided on February 1787 to send a resolution, to forward a resolution to all the 13 states and ask them to send delegates to Philadelphia. So Congress obviously found it important for the states to send delegates to Philadelphia because they wanted to see a big change in this old constitution. Okay, I'll start reading again. The states would never have appointed a convention with so much solemnity, nor described its object with so much latitude if some substantial reform had not been in contemplation. Will it be said that the fundamental principles of the Confederation were not within the purview of the con convention and ought not, have, ought not to have been varied? I ask, what are these principles? Do they require that in the establishment of the Constitution, the states should be regarded as distinct and independent sovereigns? They are so, regar they are so regarded by the Constitution proposed. Do they require that the members of the government should derive their appointment from the legislature, not from the people of the states. One branch of the new government is to be appointed by these legislatures. He's talking about the Senate. 
says the Senate under the new constitution, the senators will be chosen by the state legislatures. And under the confederation, the delegates to Congress may all be appointed immediately by the people and in two states are actually so appointed. Do they require that the powers of the government should act on the states and not immediately on individuals? In some instances, as has been shown, the powers of the new government will act on the states in their collective characters. In some instances also, those of the existing government act immediately on individuals. In cases of capture, of piracy, of the post office, of coin, coins, weights, measures, of trade with the Indians, of claims under grants of land by different states, and above all, in the case of trials by court martials in the army and navy, by which death may be inflicted without the intervention of a jury or even of a civil magistrate, in all these cases, the powers of the Confederation operate immediately on the persons and interests of individual citizens. So here he says, for those of you who keep on criticizing us because we say the Constitution, the new Constitution, gives the federal government authority to apply and enforce the laws upon individual individual Americans living in different states. Because prior to that, you had to ask the states to do things for you. Your, the federal law was not directly applicable on individuals. But here he says, even you that criticize us, even under this confederation, there are these cases where the laws of the Confederacy apply directly on people, even in matters of life and death, like in the court martials. There's, uh, you, it's the Confederate law that applies. It says, so you have a version of this new constitution already at work. You just have to learn that this thing when you look at it as a whole, it's going to bring you, provide you with more security, better security, better defense, better form of uh, getting revenue for government, and for your future prosperity, this constitution is going to be better. Then he continues, do these fundamental principles require particularly that no tax should be levied without the intermediate agency of the states. The Confederation itself authorizes a direct tax to a certain extent. On the post office, the power of coinage has been so construed by Congress as to levy a tribute immediately from that source also. But pre-termiting these instances, was it, not an, an, was it not an acknowledged ob object of the convention and the universal expectation of the people that the regulation of trade should be submitted to the general government in such a, war, in such a form as would render it an immediate source of general revenue? Had not Congress repeatedly recommended this measure as not inconsistent with the fundamental principles of the Confederation, had not every state but one, had not New York herself, so far complied with the plan of Congress as to recognize the principle of the innovation? Do these principles, in fine, require that the powers of the general government should be limited and that beyond this limit, the states should be left in possession of their sovereignty and independence. We have seen that in the new government, as in the old, the general powers are limited, and that the states, in all enumerated cases, 
in all unenumerated cases, are left in the enjoyment of their sovereign and independent jurisdictions. So he says, when you look at this new constitution, there are only certain authorities and responsibilities and rights that are enumerated to the federal government. The rest of the <coughs> rights stay with the governments of the states. So he says, we've not overstepped it. We've just given you a better constitution, something that will keep you safe and secure and also will make life not only for you but for future generations much better. Again, remember I said it in the last part of this Federalist that back then the Union was not formed yet. So Madison had to take his time and write this long article just to answer those people who were criticizing the federal position. For us today, because we see the Union, it's already United States. So this article might just be long. Why is he talking about this for so long? But back then... They were just trying to form this union. They were trying to establish this new con government, get people to ratify this new constitution. So he had to take a lot more time and explain this. We'll come back in paragraph four. We'll come back to paragraph, um, I'm sorry, to part.